you go back and you read Jefferson's letters, as I as I did. Those of you who know the story, before we started this radio show, back in 1996, uh, Louise and I sold an advertising agency in Atlanta on a seven year buyout to our employees, and we basically retired to Vermont. Said, okay, we're gonna you know take some time off. We have been working our butts off, you know, 10, 12 hour days, six, seven days a week for for about six years. And we said, okay, that's it. We're going to take some time off and and write some books. And I ended ended up writing about a book a year, and uh, and and, and, and do some traveling on behalf of uh, Salem International and and just you know. And we so we bought this house in Vermont. And in the attic of the house, in the attic actually of the carriage house, the uh, the, the sort of garage only it was too small to be a garage because it was built back when they had buggies. We found this box of books, and in that box of books was the uh, the first collected, and it's only been published twice in the history of the United States, once in 1828 and once in 1909, the collected writings of Thomas Jefferson, everything he wrote, millions and millions of words, his personal diaries, his notes on the state of Virginia, his letters, both the ones he sent and, and the ones he received. Um, his uh, his his original, you know, his uh, declaration on on religious freedom in Virginia, which he was so proud of that he had it on his tombstone instead of the fact that he was president. Uh, his presidential papers. I mean, basically everything. And I just lived inside this guy's head for two years and ended up writing two books as a result of it. One, unequal protection: how corporations became people and what we can do to fight back. And the second is what would what would Jefferson do? Which is a book that doesn't get anywhere near the. Um, the the publicity that it should uh, it's I, sh I need to mention it more often because it's a really what would Jefferson at WWJD you know right, what would Jesus do no what would Jefferson do um, is and and in that book actually I quote from one of Jefferson's letters where I discovered that he was talking about the three forces that he feared the three historic tyrannies is the phrase he used that the United States was being established to prevent from ever arising again. So what are those three historic tyrannies? And what does this have to do with our guest in the third hour and with what William Goodman was just saying? The three historic tyrannies are very simple, and Jefferson laid them out very bluntly. Number one, warlord kings. People who rise to power by virtue of the fact that they are giant bullies and they are violent, and they are physical, and they're, they're willing to rob, rape, pillage, and steal, and kill their way to the top of the pile. And that's basically how all the kingdoms of Europe began. And that's how many of them maintained their power over the years. Whether it was the right of the first night, or whether it was continual warfare with other nearby kings, where they made sure that the kings themselves and the royal families were never hurt, but the serfs always were fighting with each other. Uh, you know, whatever it was. King, the warlord kings. Number two, he was concerned about the theocrats. At the time he was president of the United States, from 1800 to 1808, or 1801 to 1809, arguably, um, Thomas Jefferson, uh, during that time, the Catholic Church controlled about three-quarters of Europe, of, of Europe, what is now Europe. It was the Catholic Empire. This was before the, the uh, Italian Revolution in, what was it, in the 1840s, the 1870s, whenever it was, when uh, Italy basically took back, you know, said, enough already. And the Vatican shrank down to this little 700 square miles. It's not even 700 square miles. It's just a couple square miles area of Vatican City. But he was concerned about the theocrats. And it wasn't just the Catholic theocrats, by the way, that he was concerned about. He was particularly concerned about the Pilgrim and the Puritan theocrats, Cromwell and his bunch who had taken over England, and then they had come to Massachusetts, and they were burning, they, were, uh, they weren't burning witches here in the United States, they were hanging them and drowning them. At when Jefferson was a child, it was still going on. And he was horrified by that. And the third was he was horrified by the third tyranny of the rich. And so he wanted to help set up a nation where the people and mass and moss, the, the people as a whole, would have all the power and make all the decisions. And he was so explicit about this over and over and over again that the power of war to, to make war is only with the House of Representatives, which gets elected every two years. It's closest to the people. 
that the power to appropriate money for defense is only in the House of Representatives. And in fact, they can only appropriate money for defense for a two-year period. His first Secretary of War, in fact, William Knox, his old friend who went off to get him an American-made suit. I told you that story the other day. And, and now this has been flipped upside down, and we've got to flip it back.